But today we're going to be in Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. Joel would be in the Old Testament and the Minor Prophets. Hope that you'll find it there with me. Joel chapter 2. As you're turning, I just want to remind you of two things real quickly. One, don't forget about this weekend coming up. Uh, we have uh, a weekend of prayer and fasting, and we want you to be involved in that. We hope that you'll plan to come for uh, at least uh, one session of prayer. We're going to pray every hour from 8 until 3. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet uh, in the back, and we hope that you will uh, plan to join us for that. Also, uh, we've mentioned a few times already Super Bowl parties. Uh, we haven't had any families volunteer homes at this time, and so we're still asking if you're interested uh, in helping out. We would love to have you uh, be a part of that uh, ministry, and it's just a great way to connect with people in your neighborhood, and so we hope that you will uh, consider that possibility if you do. Please come see me and let's talk about it. Joel chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 12 and 13, and then verses 18 and 19. Would you stand with me please, in reverence for the reading of God's Word. <clears throat> Joel chapter 2, verse 12. It says, Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, and with fasting, weeping, and mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments. Now return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness. That word in the Hebrew is the same word as grace and relenting of evil. Verse 18, then the Lord will be zealous for his land and will have pity on his people. The Lord will answer and say to his people, behold, I'm going to send you grain, new wine, and oil. You'll be satisfied and full with them, and I will never again make your approach among the nations. Let's pray. Father, we're excited about this upcoming weekend of fasting and praying. But Lord, the truth is, for many of us as Christians, as Christ followers, we, we don't really know what, what that means, what it looks like. What does it mean to fast? <laughs> so Lord, we pray that as we just take a few minutes today in your word, that you would begin to show us this important spiritual discipline in our walk with you. Father, as you do that, I pray that you'd excite us uh, about what's ahead and where you're leading us. Father, I pray too that for those who've been struggling in a spiritual famine for maybe the whole year of 2018, Lord, today you'd set us free. That you'd remove that famine, that you'd restore what has been lost. God, we want to hear from you. Lord, we want to be changed. And so, God, we ask that you would speak to us very simply and clearly today, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Why should a Christ follower fast and pray? As we prepare for this upcoming weekend of fasting and praying, I believe that it's vital that we understand the importance of these two spiritual disciplines. Prayer is actually something that's pretty common within Christianity today. It's something that we're, we're used to and maybe comfortable with, but I, it, it's sad to say that fasting seems to have taken a, a back seat to the other disciplines of the faith. That's sad because, according to Donald Whitney, the whole idea of fasting is touched on or talked about in 77 different places in Scripture. Obviously, it's important. One truth we have to learn uh, about fasting is that it cannot happen without prayer. You see, the two actually go together. The whole point is to set aside food or a television, a uh, night of television, or a, a hobby for a period of time to focus on a specific need or concern through prayer. So I give something up, I fast from something, and then when I feel hunger pains, if it's food, or when I feel a draw to do what I would normally do during that time, what is my response? It's prayer. That's right. We pray. We say, okay, Lord, this is your reminder. It's time for me to pray. And we pray for very specific and, and, and clear objectives and ideas and, and, and plans for the future. For a church family, 
We we're excited about what's ahead in 2019. And we're praying specifically for that. We believe God has massive plans for our church. And we want to start the year by, by telling Him and inviting Him to work and move in and through us in a miraculous and powerful way. So as we fast and pray, I want you to notice there will be four different objectives we're going to pray for uh, in this coming weekend. The first one is that we're praying for continued unity in our church in 2019. Continued unity in our church in 2019. God has blessed us immensely with unity. And we want to see that continue and even grow in this new year. We're also praying that God will move people from observation to participation in 2019. We'd love for you to be here to worship with us on Sundays. But folks, the reality is this is only one facet of who we are at Faith Baptist Church. This is where we connect people to God. And that's one of our goals, one of the, the, the visions that God has given us. But there's so much more. We want to put you into a, a small group. We want to find a place where you can be equipped to grow. Where you can be taught how to walk with the Lord and really live for Him. You might join a Sunday school class or a small group at a home or maybe a Bible study that we have uh, during the week. Whatever it is, observation to participation. And once you find a small group, then our real desire is that you get involved in serving the Lord. That you'd be inspired. Our third objective that we'll be praying for is that we're praying for an outbreak of one-on-one -on -one discipleship in 2019. Folks, we're never going to see true life change if we're not willing to stop long enough and walk with that new believer. Take the time to walk with them and teach them how to follow Jesus. And then finally, we're praying for the salvation and transformation of lives in 2019. So these are the goals. These are the objectives that we're praying for. And the prophet Joel gives us some, some insight into the importance of fasting as we pray. Judah, during this time, that's who Joel is talking to in our, our text, the nation of Judah, they just suffered a, a, a great famine because of an infestation of locusts during the harvest season. The bugs literally ate everything. So these people have almost nothing to live on. No sustenance for survival. While that might not seem to apply to us in the United States today where there's food everywhere all the time, hear me. No, we're not facing a physical family in the United States, but folks, we are facing a serious spiritual famine. A famine that is destroying families in our country and, and is leaving people feeling helpless and hopeless. So how do we overcome a spiritual famine? That's the question we ask today. Let me just show you two answers real quickly in our text. How do we overcome... The, this spiritual famine. Number one, we must return to our first love. We must return to our first love and understand that a return always requires repentance. Notice again in verse 12, just the first part, he says, yet even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart. Return to me with all your heart. The word return reminds us that a person literally has to change directions if they were going to return to some, somewhere. So people who fly, who use airplanes for travel, you understand the idea of returning, right? Yeah. You have a departing flight that takes you somewhere, and then you have a returning flight that brings you back to where you were. That's the idea that Joel has for us today in a spiritual sense. We're walking in one direction, and that direction is leading us to spiritual famine. It's, it, it includes sin. It includes just a lackadaisical spirit. And somehow, some way, God gets our attention and takes us from where we are going currently and returns us to where He wants us to be. Folks, that is called repentance. It is turning away from where we were to where God wants us to be. And I want you to notice that 
in our text, he shows us here how we, we repent. Notice, as you continue in verse 12, repent to me, return to me with all your heart, excuse me, and with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Now, why in the world would he include weeping and mourning with fasting? Folks, it's, it's very simple. Repentance is an act of the will. But it's also, or it's always followed by an understanding, a realization that I have failed. I have left my first I've gone in a different direction. I've been walking opposite the way that Jesus has called me to walk. And in some way, somehow, again, God gets my attention and brings me back, begins to return me to that right way. And folks, that return includes weeping and mourning. Why? I've missed out on so much. Because I've chosen to walk my own way and do what I want to do. Now please hear me. You know, sometimes we would think, well, you know, that if that's a person, they wouldn't be in church. Actually, they would. Many of you are here today just because this is what you do on Sunday morning. But the truth is that some of us in this room are struggling through a spiritual famine. We're struggling through a time when there's really not sustenance coming into our lives, and there is no sustenance for us to draw from. And God says to us so clearly through the prophet Joel that if we're going to return to the Lord, then it's going to include mourning and weeping and fasting. We're going to understand our failure and our mistake. So we weep and we mourn over that failure to stay connected to the one who gave everything for us. Fasting is that first step to reconnect to the one that we love so dearly. You and I will never overcome a spiritual famine without repentance that is laced with fasting, weeping, and mourning. God hates sin, and we must learn to do the same. Weeping and mourning simply reveal our feelings towards our own failure. So, God wants us to return to our first love. We must return to our first love. And that happens, that return always includes repentance. But in verse 13, he tells us not only does it include repentance, but notice a return always requires a rending. Notice there with me in verse 13. And rend your heart and not your garments. Now return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, and relenting of evil. The Jewish custom of that day was when something angered you, when something upset you, when, when, when you felt this need for repentance, or you realized, or maybe your sin was exposed to the community, what you would do is take the outer garment that you wore, and you would rip it. You would tear it. You would rend it. The prophet Joel says, God's no longer interested in your outer garments being rent. What he wants is for your heart to be broken. For your heart to be broken before him. Joel tells us, leave our clothes intact and come to the Lord with a broken heart. Again, Joel is giving specific instructions to overcome a famine that was caused by sin, by their sin and stupidity. He wants them to recognize their role in the famine and come to him humbly and ready to change. And that starts with a broken heart. Until we get there, repentance and, and, and healing will never really happen. We say it regularly, don't we? Until they hit rock bottom, they'll never truly repent. Folks, the same applies to, to each of us who are struggling through a spiritual family. We must rend our hearts before the Lord so that our repentance is more than words. It is a complete 
radical life change. So I wonder, are you in the midst of a famine? Are you in the midst of a, a spiritual famine that, that maybe has been going on for a period of time? The first suggestion that Joel gives us is that we return to our first love. And he reminds us that returning always requires repentance. And that returning always requires a rending of our hearts. So we come to the Lord with a truly broken heart and in genuine repentance. And what will God do? That's verses 18 and 19. He tells us here that he will restore all your famine loss. So when we return to our first love, then he will restore all of our famine loss. Now notice verse 18. He says, Then the Lord will be zealous for his land, and he will have pity on his people. Now I want you to remember something here. When God hears our prayers, when God hears our repentance, our rending of our heart, understand that he searches our hearts. He searches our hearts. <laughs> We have this, this idea that all we have to do is say it. But God says, I'm not, I'm not really caught up in what you're saying. I want to see your heart. I want to see, do you truly mean the words that are coming from your mouth? Notice he starts there in verse 18 with the word then. In this text, it's such an important Word because it's a reminder that God must see the first for the rest to happen. I've got to return to my first love before He will restore our famine loss. Again, He doesn't just listen to our words, He searches our hearts to see if our motives are pure and our repentance is genuine. And I believe with all my heart that God desperately wants to restore your famine loss, but He has to see more than the naked eye can see. So if you're stuck in a spiritual family, then God is calling you to repentance and, and a rending of your heart, meaning your heart is broken and ready for restoration. But folks, if your heart is still filled with pride, it has, it's this whole idea, I can do this by myself. I do not need God. I can do it on my own. I can look real spiritual and sound real spiritual in church, but when it comes to life, I can do what I want to do. Folks, there's no repentance there because it's, it's pride. It's all about me. Look what I can accomplish. So we, we're not going to experience this restoration until we're willing to set aside that pride and repent. And rend our hearts before him. Now, coming to the altar. Or calling a friend for help. Those are great starts to the restoration process. But understand that's not all God is asking. He's not just saying, well, if you'll walk down this aisle and get on your knees and, and, and cry a few tears and say you're sorry. That's, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about your life. The proof of what you say. Have you truly repented of your sin? Have you truly rent your heart before Him? And how will God respond when we truly do those things? Well, notice there, Joel says in verse 18, then the Lord will be zealous for His land. The word zealous there in the Hebrew is actually translated jealous, more often than zealous in the Old Testament. Here's what it means, according to the Dictionary of Biblical Languages. It means to have a feeling of ill will, ranging even to anger, based on a desire for exclusivity in a relationship. So when he says the Lord is jealous for his land, what is he saying? He's saying God is not looking to share our hearts with any other God. He, he's not willing to share with any other. Why? Because he is jealous for your heart. It is his. And he wants it completely devoted to him. So he is jealous for our hearts. But he says also there 
that he will have pity on his people. Again, in the Hebrew, that word pity can actually be translated mercy. He will have mercy upon his people. What does that word mean? It means to show kindness to one in an unfavorable, difficult, or dangerous situation, and so help or deliver in some manner, implying in some cases that the one in the distress may deserve the condition. In other words, you and I have dug a deep hole. A hole so deep we can't get ourselves out. But when I repent and when I rend my heart before the Lord, then His mercy takes steps in and He pulls me out of that hole and actually helps me to leave it behind. That's mercy. That is what God is saying to you and to me as you repent and as you rend your hearts that I will show mercy upon you. So first, God searches our hearts. And after he does so, his first response is mercy. But then notice verse 19. The Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I'm going to send you grain and new wine and oil. Now stop for a second. Why would that be so important for them to hear? Because they're in a famine. None of those things are present. They've lost all of what they would have. And Joel now says, listen, I'm, and God's going to restore what you've lost. All your famine loss, he'll restore. And you'll be satisfied and full with them, and I will never again make your approach among the nations. Listen, this is God's mercy and grace toward us. We said it many times, but let me just remind you again that mercy is God not giving us what we deserve. And grace is God giving us what we do not deserve. God promises to, to break the famine that has devastated their land and to give them more grain and more wine and more, more oil than they could ever use. God turns the famine into incredible surplus. And those who are hungry are now full. They're satisfied. By what God has done. And folks, even if we repent and rend our hearts, do we deserve surplus and incredible blessings? Remember, we dug the hole. We did. No one else, me, you, we dug the hole. But for God to not only pull us out of the hole, but then to walk with us away from that hole and to bless us and restore to us what we lost in that hole, that is God's mercy. And that is what he offers to you and to me as we repent and rend our hearts before him. 2019 is going to be here in two days. Are you ready to get out of that spiritual famine that has plagued you throughout 2018? Joel gives us some wonderful insight, uh, a wonderful meat to chew on in these verses. See, if we're going to see the famine lift, then we must return to our first love, which means we must repent and we must rend our hearts. And once we've done that, God is going to restore our famine loss. All that we've missed out on will be fully restored to us. Not because we deserve it, but because of God's grace and mercy. The game of baseball is actually one of my favorites. It's amazing because it's one of the few sports that a player can go into a slump that literally changes their whole year. Sometimes their whole career. Mike Wool is a perfect example. 2005, he was with the, or sorry, yeah, 2005, he was with the Miami Marlins. Listen, he hit 236, had eight home runs and 500 bats. He was traded in 2006 to the Boston Red Sox. He batted 284 with 20 home runs. And in 200, uh, 2007, he batted 324 with 120 RBIs. 
And one of his former teammates, Jeff Conine, said this. He tried everything to get out of it. He tried too hard. I believe the guys that struggle the most to get out of a slump are the smart guys that care. Mike cared more than anyone. He tried harder than anyone. But whatever he tried didn't work. Now whether you call it a slump or you call it a famine, the result is the same. Are you ready to end it? You say, Kevin, you don't understand. The last month, the last two months, the last three or four months, I've been doing everything I knew to do to get out of this spiritual famine, to get out of this slump in my life. <coughs> yes, but I ask you, have you done what God asked you to do? Not what you think you should do, but what God asked you. Folks, in the end, it goes back to our hearts. Have you surrendered and said, Lord, I've been in a spiritual slump. I've been in a spiritual famine. But as this new year comes about, I don't want that any longer, Lord. And so I repent of my sin. I return to my first love through repentance that includes fasting and weeping and mourning. It includes a rending of my heart. My heart is broken because of my own failure in this past year. But Lord, search my heart and know me. Because, Father, I desperately want to be restored. I want to be brought out of that hole that I've dug and restored what I've lost. That happens because of God's mercy and grace. But it only happens when we return to our